Okay, isotopes. So this part confused a lot of you guys, and I know it sucks. I'm sorry. It's super inconvenient. And you would think that, you know, the laws of the universe would be super ordered, but we have isotopes to account for. So basically all isotopes are are different atoms of the same element that have a different number of neutrons. Okay, so remember I told you they always have the same number of protons, always, 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 always. All gold molecules, or sorry, not molecules, all gold atoms always have the same number of protons, 79. All oxygen atoms always have eight protons, okay? But to be really annoying and confusing, atoms can have a different number of neutrons. Okay, so if they have a different number of neutrons, if they have one more or two more or three less or whatever it may be, what is that going to change? Is that going to change our atomic number or our mass number? What do you think? Yep, mass number, right? Because it's changing the overall mass. If we have more or less of a neutron, it's going to change the mass. Okay, so we're not really going to study isotopes very much in this class, but you do need to know, it says right here, you need to know that isotopes of an element can have different mass numbers because, because, because the different amount of neutrons. Okay, so here's an example with our oxygen. Here's regular gummy bears and here's sour gummy bears just for distinction. This is the same picture as we saw before, the same Bohr model, okay? I did a little bit better job of making the circle with the sour ones. <laughs> Um, okay, how many of each of these subatomic particles do we have? How many protons do we have in this isotope of oxygen? Yep, it's eight. How many neutrons do we have? Yep, we've got one extra. And electrons? We've got eight still. So remember, electrons aren't going to change either. Protons and electrons aren't going to change. We just got one extra neutron. So what does that end up changing? The atomic number or the mass number? Atomic number stays the same at eight. Mass number, it changes. It was 16 before, remember, because we had eight and eight. But it changed to 17 because eight plus 17 is, or eight plus nine is 17. Okay? Make sense? So typically, typically isotopes of the same element have very, very similar physical and chemical properties, but sometimes they do change. And like I said, we're not really going to um, get into this too much, but if you have any questions about this, let me know. Um, I gave you guys this problem on the homework for this section, and it definitely confused a lot of you. Um, so it's telling you to identify, is this a molecule, a molecule, is this an atom of oxygen 16, oxygen 17, or oxygen 18? And by the way, isotopes, when we have different isotopes of different elements that are common, we'll abbreviate them like this. So the normal um, oxygen that we find in the periodic table, which is the most common, which is why they put that one on the periodic table, that's the one we call oxygen 16. But there are also oxygen 17 and 18. Um, that exist in the atmosphere in different places. Um, like I said, we'll talk more about that probably in biology or environmental science or marine science. But what you need to know here, what it's asking you is to identify which isotope this is. And it says, assume that all the protons and neutrons are visible in this drawing. So, okay, go ahead and count for me. Count the number of protons, which are the green ones, and count the number of neutrons. Okay, so our mass number, to figure out which isotope this is, remember these are these look very similar to our mass numbers. So to figure out the mass number, we're going to add these two together, add our protons and neutrons together, and what do you get? Yeah, you get 17. So our isotope here is oxygen 17. Okay, I hope that makes a little bit more sense. I am opening the homework um, for you to go and review if you want to. Okay, moving on to section 4.3, Modern Atomic Theory. There's a lot of information in here. Um, and a lot of it is introductory stuff. Um, it's kind of hard to understand, you guys. I definitely struggled with this when I was learning chemistry. Um, so don't feel bad if it's kind of going over your head or you're not really getting it. I'm not going to test you on 
um, the majority of what's in this section just because we're going to learn more about the energy and electrons and orbitals in the next two chapters as we learn about chemical bonds and chemical reactions. So this was kind of just an introductory way. I don't really like the way that this textbook um, describes some things and this section was one of them. So here's the takeaways. Here's what I want you to know for the quiz, okay? Um, electrons exist in an atom outside of the nucleus right our nucleus is in the middle okay always in the middle electrons orbit around the nucleus outside of it and for a long time we thought that they orbit in these nice circular patterns that's not true um but we will draw our atoms like this every time because it's just easier to represent that this is what's happening when we get into the next chapter, we're going to have to start accounting for these um, electrons as we're making chemical bonds and breaking them and stuff. So it's really important that we draw these out and we know, okay, this first shell we can fit two, the second shell we can fit eight, the third shell, so on and so on and so on, okay? But the nitty gritty basics, what I want you to know of this is these electrons can actually move up and down in between these shells or these orbitals. A lot of times we'll call them shells, electron shells, electron orbitals, um, the cloud. We'll talk about the cloud in just a second. But when they're moving, when they're moving between different levels, shell orbitals, that is energy. They're either losing energy or they're gaining energy. And what's energy again? Well, energy is heat, light, electricity, lots of different forms of energy. In particular, we're talking about light here, okay? So when um, electrons get excited, that just means that they are, the electrons are moving up or down in one of these levels, okay? And here's a real world example that you can relate to. We have neon lights, right? Those cool, um, like really fluorescent looking lights. We call them neon lights, but they actually have any of the noble gases inside of them. So all of our noble gases, again, those are on the far right of our periodic table. Those are helium, argon, neon is actually a noble gas, krypton, and xenon. Okay, so how do these lights work? Well, we put these, we trap these noble gases in these light bulbs, and then we send an electric current through them, and they excite the electrons of these atoms and then they emit light back out towards us okay so that's what we're seeing we're seeing those electrons being excited and moving between energy levels okay so that's all i really want you to know right now is excited electrons equals light all right because that's a huge part of our world we'll talk more about real world applications later on but that's kind of the basics of what i want you to know for this and this whole electron cloud thing, man, it's hard. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little preview of this video that is actually for two chapters away from now. I'm not going to test you on this stuff, but I want to get your head in the right setting. So you're thinking about, okay, stuff isn't as neat nor organized as I want it to be. And this is what it actually looks like, or this is what we think. This is the latest model of what we um, have proven that it looks like. Okay, so just watch this. It's about a minute long, and then we'll wrap up. ...is the electron field. In order for an electron to exist, there has to be an excitation of the electron field, and we can describe those excitations as waves, just as a wave in the ocean is an excitation of the water. At any given moment, the electron can be anywhere within the function of a wave. But waves are defined not by harsh boundaries. Instead, they're strong in some areas and weak in others. The strength of the wave at one certain point in space determines how likely it is that you will find the electron there at any given time if you measure. And so, if we're trying to understand reality, we should not think of electrons as circling around the nucleus of an atom like planets around a star, but instead as an excitation around the nucleus. And the shape of that excitation is the orbital. Orbitals are precisely the reason that everything exists. They are the root and the key and the nexus and the crux and the keystone and every other metaphor of not just chemistry, but existence. Thank you for watching this
Okay, that's it. Um, basically, yeah, these orbitals, they're weird. They're funky. Um, we've gotten really good at predicting what they look like, but, you know, who knows? Some scientists might come along in another 50 years and be like, uh, sorry, you guys were super wrong about it. Um, so this is our current model, and we'll talk more about that in the next few chapters. Okay, hope this review helped. Um, you should be able to go take your quiz now. Just make sure to play this video all the way to the very end, and I will stop talking now.